Hello, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anureka Chari Vag, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. Today we are going to discuss a paper titled Peasant and the Raj 1. This paper is part of the larger paper called Agrarian Social Structure and Change, which is coordinated by Dr. Manish Thakur of IIM Kolkata. In this paper or module titled Peasant and the Raj 1, we are going to look into the colonial introduction of Indian peasant life. We are going to look into how the colonial rulers have understood the peasant life of within Indian society. Further, we will look into the whole idea of village community and also the colonial forms of knowledge construction. Further, we will focus on the processes of revenue settlement that was followed and initiated by the British government that has changed the way rural society stru was structured. Further, we will also look into the ideology of the colonial rule with regard to the peasant and rural life in India in particular. The Peasant and the Raj 1 To effect a settlement of the land revenue was the first major administrative act of the British government, so wrote Henry Sumner Main way back in the mid-19th century. Indeed, land revenue settlement did more than determine revenue. It defined the rights to land and devised different mechanisms for revenue assessment and collection. It also was an exercise in how best to fit the disparate facts of Indian social order into proper modes of British explanation. In the process, it signaled a new level of involvement of the colonial state in the village. In fact, land revenue system was an exercise of historic significance which brought the colonial state, the Raj and the peasants face to face. The processes and practices of land settlement drew Indian village along with the peasants into the British conception of the rule of law. Although the village remained the primary site for content administrative interface between the ruler British and the ruled Indians, it acquired larger association in the ruler's idiom. This module is an attempt to understand the contours of the relationship between the peasant and the Raj, the new inegals. The new relationship between the present and the Raj has had implications for the history and character of the colonial forms of knowledge. Since the colonial state had significantly affected the basic structures of Indian life by regulating peasant life in new ways, the exercise of power and accumulation of knowledge both were parts of larger colonial project. The British attempt to regulate the peasant life was inseparable from their effort to design an ideology that could sustain their rule over it. The larger point is that the administrative practices of the colonial regime cannot be separated from the colonial construction of Indian society. An understanding of the relationship between the peasant and the Raj thus presupposes an appreciation of the fact that colonialism has been as much about policies as about theories and strategies of representation. As the British went along comprehending India using their own forms of knowledge and thinking, they also altered the nature of Indian knowledge. Their engagement with the village, however concerned it was with the practical problem of setting agrarian policies, was not a matter of simply endorsing whatever relations of production were existing within the village. Instead, it also involved active social engineering. As Smith has shown in his remarkable study of the changing nature of village records from 1822 to 1887, in the Ludhiana district in Punjab, village statistics contain great details not only of land rights but also more general aspects of social organization. In effect, the registration of rights in the land revenue settlements meant affecting people into the predetermined legal categories and pressing the management of a village affairs into a uniform mold. And the exact shape of the legal mold was not determined overnight but entailed detailed negotiation with the past revenue collection practices. The Raj facilitated increasing importance of the British conception of India and the Indian institutions. In due course and more so after gaining in confidence with the annexation of the last vestiges of native rules such as those of the Marathas and in Punjab, the British became the authoritative and effective giver of value to things Indian. For example, it was the British who defined the value and meaning of the Indian village in a way that it echoes are yet to die down. As Smith remarks, the discourse of knowledge about Indian society is still to some extent tracked by the terms under which official records and reports were produced during the period of the British rule. Until the 20th, early 20th century, Indians were largely bystanders to the discussions which established meaning and value for the British, be it village, caste, Hinduism or Hinduism. Even when Indians entered into the discussion, both the agenda and its terms of discourse were already set. Arguably, the 19th century debate on the nature of Indian village community and the present life has determined the nature of the discourse of Indian village since then. 
In this module, we consider the colonial ideas regarding the peasant and by implication of the village. In a larger sense, it also reveals as to how British conceptualized India and its past and present within the terms of the intellectual thought. A specific focus is on the works of the colonial scholar administrator. There is a specific carrier of the term peasant or village presented here as a part of the history of the colonial knowledge about India and the use of that knowledge in official projects. This module should offer you a sense of capacity of the colonial state to reconstruct fundamental aspects of Indian society. The Raj and stereotypes of the Indian peasant life. A seasoned historian like Stokes has expressed his despair at extracting the village out of its historical morass caused by interlocking of land tenures with tax collection structures in an ancient order of civilization. Admittedly, the force of subconscious ideology and the practical need to stabilize the tax system with an impersonal bureaucracy prompted the British at the outset of the colonial rule to refashion the village. Nonetheless, the village as a working unit of rural society was reconstituted during the British rule. In effect, the village was proclaimed basis of colonial rule. However, there was nothing natural about the village as a basic unit of territorial organization. A close historical scrutiny reveals that to be a discovery of the late 18th or 19th century. In fact, the literature on the nature of Indian village community and peasant life traces back to Thomas Munro's report on Madras and the first decade of the 19th century. The discovery of this cornerstone of society started mundanely. As a colonial administrator felt the need to collect and compile factual information about land settlements and revenue collection. Indeed, most of the characterizations of village are contained in the dispatches of senior British officers engaged in land revenue administration. One such dispatch which formed the basis for discussion in the British House of Commons in 1812-13 on the renewal of East India Company's character outlined the idea of the village as a mini-republic. More particularly, it is the Thomas Munro's report on the ceded district of Madras, 186, that one comes across the initial stereotype of village as a little republic. Like his contemporaries, Munro was less concerned with the village as such more than the mode of land settlement. His primary interest was to plead and win the case for Rayatwari settlement in the Madras presidency as against Bengali presidency's permanent settlement. In his acrimonious debate with Francis Ellis, he showed that his advocacy of the right worry respects the principles of native tradition and that he was merely adhering to the indigenous precedents. Once Munro became the governor in 1820 and established Rajdwari as a definite legal basis for land settlements in Madras presidency, his formulations became part of the official wisdom. Some of the administrative reports set the tone for future debate on the nature and character of Indian village and peasantry. In subsequent literature, we find repetitions and variations of the set themes which form the part of the fifth report. What is noteworthy, however, is the celebration of Indian village that is guided by the ideology of particular administrators than the characteristics that peasants of village actually displayed. Stokes identified administrators such as Munro, Malcolm, Elphinstone and Metcalfe who stood under Lord Wellesley, the Governor General, as the chief proponents of the republican nature of Indian village. Munro was a leader and founder of this particular school of thought. While sharing a certain emotional kinship with the heritage of the past, these romantic paternalists, as Stokes labels them, were horrified at the wanton uprooting of an immemorial system of society. In their general political orientation, they were antithetical to the liberal attempt to anglicize, assimilate and reform Indian society. From their attitudes of romanticism and paternalism flowed a certain conservatism of thought which made them challenge and resist the policy of applying British constitutional principles to Indian administration. In, system, in terms of routine administration, it means countering the spirit of Cornwallis system. Whereas Munro was in favor of the Rajdwari cultivator wise system of land settlement, Metcalfe made a powerful advocacy of the Mahalwari village wise settlement. Madras and Bombay presidencies largely followed Rajdwari, but the northwest provinces, Metcalfe ensured that the village communities were made basis of revenue settlement. Clearly, the advocacy for a particular type of revenue set system was contingent on their political philosophy. Their opposition to the utilitarian laissez faire was reflected in the attempts to preserve something of the methods and the institutions of Indian society. To the extent that they were against remolding India in the image of the West, they can be regarded as the true conservative elements of in the history of British India. Their opposition to the Cornwallis system, in essence, was an opposition to the imposition of English ideas and institutions on Indian society. In their attempt to cushion the impact of foreign domination, they 
rusticated the unchanging village republics as a sign of the bellowing paternalism. Village communities provided them with the system of indirect rule without much meddling in the Indian affairs. They firmly believed that the ultimate objective of the variant of land settlement was the protection of the village community by the government and not against it. Fearful of the social effects of the sudden dissolution of the co-sharing village community, they were in favor of fitting the colonial administration colonial administration to the native frame of society. Their awareness of the wholly artificial and foreign character of administration made them hesitant and wary of interfering with the prevailing forms of society. They were convinced that once law and order had been established and property rights in the soil defined and the land revenue fixed in cash, there was no need to subject the village to disruptive changes and disastrous effects of the Anglicization, Anglicization drive. For them, the Anglicists were responsible for setting aside the immemorial institutions of the native people and erecting in its place an incomprehensible technical form of law which was unsuited to the native genius. In other words, these paternalists were all set to challenge the dominion exercised by utilitarianism and show that utilitarian principles were not of absolute and universal validity. Since utilitarianism and its underlying principles were conditional truths by virtue of their historical origins, there was an urgent necessity of restraint in pressing Western reforms upon an Oriental society like India. To them, unbridled uti utilitarianism only increased the danger of a rapid disintegration of Indian society. Munro went to the extent of advocating the restoration of the jurisdiction of the village panchayats so as to prevent the further erosion of his mainstay of the social order. It is difficult to make how much of the Indian village was a British construction in terms of empirical fact. It is possible that a phenomena one labels as a product of foreign impact may have actually been Indian in origin. The intrusive institutions, especially when it is backed by political power, may reinforce the indigenous institution when they both share something in common, giving a prominence it did not have under the old system. For example, the Royat Wari. Thus, at most, we can talk about 19th century Indian village more as an idea than as a fact. Yet, the independent movement of administrative systems once underway ensured that there was no going back. Also, the village got implicated in the differing perceptions of the unit of land measurement of the British and the Indian. In place of the English idea of the estate as a unit of land management, paternalists like Metclay favored the Indian ideal of Mahal as a unit of land measurement. In fact, one difficulty facing Westerners, whether 19th century administrators or 20th century economics, Indian village is a number of differences in the units of thought between the people in control of the countryside and the Englishmen who ruled them. There were differences in thought about the objectives of secular life and about how these objectives fitted together and in the situations in which they re reason. The contending per perceptions of the village emanated from these fundamental differences in the categories of thought as well. Ironically, the village community was used as an argument against the generalization of Munro's Rayatwari both in Madras and in Delhi. Those who were in favor of Mozawari or the Mahalwari shared the apprehension that direct engagement for revenue with each separate landholder or cultivator might lead to the destruction of the or original constitution of the village. Though the early administrative literature of the 19th century does not talk of the community, this emphasis on the village community as a political entity tend to ignore or at least underplay the facts of dominance and hierarchy within the village. The stability and isolation of the village and its political independence from the state were overemphasized. Given the political fluidity that was evidenced at the macro level, the permanence of the village held a great attraction. Yet, Metclaw's romanticized vision of the village was difficult to re reconcile with the community it described. Although the disruptions of the later 18th century had enforced a great deal of self-reliance upon the Indian village, it was much less isolated from the state and the market and much less egalitarian than Metcliffe's rhetoric implied. The community of co-sharers in the land rarely encompassed the entire population. Nevertheless, Metcliffe's text resonated through the years. Neither the decline of romanticism nor that of independent village community itself could dislodge Metcliffe's characterization of village. Surprisingly, when village was being substantially incorporated into a system of general law and colonial economy, it alleged virtues of political economy and economic self-reliance were gaining ground. This clearly reveals the elements of nostalgia in the way village was perceived by administrators like Metcalf. Viewing the a stereotyping of village lay in the quantum leap from the economic self-sufficiency and internal organization of the village as an economic political group to the supposed political independence of the village. 
one finds in these early administrative accounts of the village no reference to the existence of inequality. This could be because inequality and hierarchy were considered to be natural and in tune with the spirit of age. However, village tends to acquire a metaphoric content as republic, commonwealth or state by virtue of its being an ordered society in miniature. Thus, Finstone, in one of the most forceful articulation of the village as a political society, proclaimed, These communities contain in miniature all the materials of a state within themselves are an almost sufficient to protect the members, if all governments are withdrawn. The community's apparent ability to preserve admits disintegration of larger forms of political and social organize, organization gets corroborated by Malcolm. The second aspect of the village stereotype, namely that of corporate body of person sharing right in a common territory, is linked to the first one, for the idea of village as a political community presupposes economic self-sufficiency. This view of the village finds its initial articulation in the Ellis report on Mirasi rights, also in this aspect of village community which was ca catapulted to the arena of high theory by Main and Mark. Thus, the essence of all such characterization of the village was a Eurofix celebration of its inner elasticity as a system. Romantic, conservative, romantic conservatives were attracted to its permanence, more so when it was seen in relation to highly volatile and fluid character of the Indian state. Its high degree of internal cohesion and enduring solidarity and its constitution as a sum total of mutually dependent groups rather than mutually antagonistic classes provided the romantics the raw material on which to construct the image of the Indian society. However, it should be noted that enthusiastic reception accorded to the Indian village by these romantic paternalists were not shared by one and all. In a way, the village was caught in the larger political battles of the day between conservatives and radicals. First, in the fact that the creation of private rights and the elimination of custom was leading to the decline of the village communities should not give rise to any false sentiment of regret. Stephen denounced a sentimental outcry of the conservative paternalist as regards the breakup of the village communities and had no love lost for the simple communities. He thought that the task of insulating Indian village from further change was well high impossible. Similarly, John Strachey criticized the fashioning of commending the Hindus, the laws and the government. He worried till these late discoveries it was generally admitted that the native system of administration was oppressive and vicious and that faster we departed from them, the better. Administrators like Stephen and Strachey distrusted the sentimental, sentimental attachment of the paternalist to the Indian village. For them, however, as a matter of conviction, the truths of political economy should triumph over sentiment and that only in a system of free exchange and completely free individual property rights could the prosperity of the people be fully secured. Naturally, this man's stringent application of utilitarian doctrines to India, irrespective of its effects on the village community. Students, in conclusion to this module titled Peasant and the Raj 1, we have to question the stereotypes of Indian peasant life. This stereotype of Indian peasant life has been really established and institutionalized by the colonial scholar administrators, especially in the studies to understand that of the village. Their understandings of the village has really helped to frame our own understandings of the concept of village community. Therefore, it becomes paramount of importance that we need to question these stereotypes with regard to Indian peasant life and start thinking about how to relook at the whole idea of village community again. Thank you.